complete bios, this, I could take another 10 minutes, the complete bios uh, are in your forum program, so I'll be brief in the introductions. Our first panelist is the president of Economic Community Development Institute, ECDI. Please welcome Steve Fireman to my left. Next uh, panelist is the president and CEO of Goodwill Columbus, somebody who's familiar to most, if not all of us, Mar <laughs> Margie Pizzuti. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, author, lecturer, and marketing expert, Roger Blackwell. <laughs> and the executive director of Impact Community Action, please welcome Bo Chilton. Our moderator today is radio journalist with the State House News Bureau, Joe Ingalls. On behalf of the Metropolitan Club, I want to thank our speakers for being here. And Joe, it's all yours. OK, great. Well, thank you. It's great to be here at the Columbus Metropolitan Club and to be part of this important discussion. I'm so glad you invited me for this. Um, you know, as journalists, we often look at unemployment figures. And we're often talking about the numbers but really, those numbers don't reflect everything. And as our panelists will tell you, there are a lot of people who are never reflected in those numbers. Um, people who maybe are, are ex-felons, people with disabilities, or people who have just given up hope of pursuing the American dream as we know it. And uh, so that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about what can be done um, and how we can help people succeed as a society who maybe are, are stumbling over obstacles. Um, the success stories are out there, and uh, I'm sure that these folks can tell us some of those as well. And so we'll be looking at what makes the difference. Um, that's the question we'll be exploring. And at 1255, you folks will get the chance to ask some questions. Um, but for right now, I'm going to take a turn and, and ask a couple of questions to get us started. So I guess I'll start with uh, Marjorie Prezuti. Um, with Goodwill. She works with people who have disabilities, people who are hard to employ. And in that capacity, Marjorie, um, what is the biggest impediment uh, for people that you serve when it comes to getting a job that they can make a living wage and be self-existent? Joe, that's a great question, and it's at the core of what we do. Uh, as many of you know, we uh, provide a range of services for individuals, not just with physical, developmental, mental disabilities, but also other barriers to employment, ex-offenders, homeless populations, English as a, a second language, limited education. Um, and there are several barriers uh, to that. Uh, and we meet those barriers with a broad range of tools and tactics. It's not just one tactic that's gonna do it, and that's why we take a holistic approach at Goodwill, and I know some of my um, agencies in the community do this as well, but through our Battelle Career Education Center, uh, we have, as I said, a, a, a toolkit that really helps the individual be competitive because every single person in this room can turn to probably two or three other people's, you, people as a network. You've got relationships, you've got networks, you're constantly getting calls and making calls, to people who you want to help get employed. Individuals in poverty, individuals that have barriers to employment don't have that network. And I'll talk a little later about the whole bridge over po poverty initiative or movement. But the point is, it is helping that person develop their interview skills. It is helping that person develop a competitive resume. It is um, having that person take our uh, job readiness class, which is 15 hours, and it's soft skills, getting to work on time, how to negotiate with uh, your peers and your supervisor, uh, how to organize your time. Those are the soft skills that can make or break an individual, and those are the, those are the things we offer. Transitional work we offer in our retail stores, with, in our janitorial services business. Um, with community partners, uh, many community partners, some of whom are in this room. And so it's those multiple range of things that help those with uh, disabilities and other barriers to really give them a hand up, not just a hand out. Right. Right. Well, Roger Blackwell, um, we've known you for a long time, 40 years at The Ohio State University, a respected business professor. 
uh, you've got a long resume, and I won't go through that because it's in your uh, bulletin there, but we also know you've had some struggles, and through those struggles, you've learned a lot. You're coming out with a new book. You're going to be talking about uh, some of the things that can help people get employed, especially maybe some people who are hard to employ, like uh, ex-felons. So let me ask you, in the spirit of entrepreneurship, which is what you'll be talking about in your new book, how do you take people who maybe have a background that's hard to uh, get a job and turn them into people who can create their own jobs? Well, it's very difficult to get a job. Uh, if you're part of kind of the last category or group of people to be openly discriminated against, and that's sex offenders. And I can illustrate it with a man, I'll say his name is Oscar, that's not his real name, Oscar was a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, started early, before he graduated from high school, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as an entrepreneur, all in cash. And he knew how to have lean inventories. He knew customer service extremely well. And his cash management, unfortunately, was to stick wads of $100 bills in his pockets and party all night breakfast by 6 a.m., and he was making literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as an entrepreneur, but the next 10 years, he was making about $15 a month. And after 10 years, he got out, and something happened to him while he was in prison. It was called Kairos Ministry. I have seen thousands of people in prison, and I don't recall ever anyone being rehabilitated except through faith-based ministries. I'm sure there might be someone someplace, but that's, in his case, Oscar, when he got out, he didn't want to go back to the old business. He could, because you learn how to perfect your skills so you won't get caught in the future. So he could have done that, but he didn't. He wanted a job. And what do most employers say about him? I'm sorry, they don't even say I'm sorry. They usually just say, we don't hire felons. And big corporations, and if you are in a big corporation, you should ask whether your corporation is still one that discriminates against a group of people. And Oscar got a job with a small business here in town, does mulch business. After, and that small entrepreneur looked at him, big guy, 6'4", strong, infectious personality, Ladies come up and give him their phone numbers all the time. I've, I've been trying to learn something from him, actually. But, uh, but this man said, will you work hard? He said, yes, sir. He said, okay, be here at 7 o'clock next, next Monday morning. And he is. And he's been there every day. But I should tell you, he lives on the east side, and it takes two hours to transfer a bus, to take a bus downtown, then transfer to the Worthington area, it's two hours, so to be there at 7 a.m., I bet there's some of you have problems at being at 7 a.m. at work every day. He has to leave at 5 a.m., and he has to take another couple hours coming home. He gets paid for eight hours of work, but it really is a 12-hour day, and that's typical. That's not unusual, and he gets, but he does. He's making a living. He's been there every day at work except a couple days in July when the buses weren't running, Unfortunately, he worked for a small business who understood. He gets paid $8 an hour. He will, and he's doing well. He's really doing well in all parts of his life. But he will always be part of the struggling middle class, if not poverty, unless he does something else. N very few people, start to say none, that's not quite true, but very few people will move in the whole US from the struggling middle class to the prosperous middle class unless they know how to start a business and grow it and run it. There are between 18 and 19,000 corporations in America that are classified as large, over 500 employees. But there are 26.5 million small businesses, six million of those with employees. And don't expect your children, if they graduate from college, or if they don't get through high school, to be in the prosperous middle class unless they know how to start and grow a business, which takes three things. 
One, it takes knowledge. Two, and this is the great misunderstanding, it takes a little tiny bit of capital. Most successful people start with no capital or very little. This new book that Joe talked about is called Garage Entrepreneurs. If you want to be wealthy, start out poor. 90% of all, uh, I'm sorry, 70% of all billionaires in the US started out with nearly nothing. They are the Les Wexners and the John McConnells and the Sarah Blakeleys of the world. Everybody knows the story of Sarah Blakely? $5,000, she started out as a babysitter and now she is new, America's newest billionaire. No debt and no outside capital from anyone. So take away the capital, because that's one of the great misunderstandings. You probably will be, if you get a lot of capital, you'll probably be a failure in business. I, I just saw one the other day. They got $400,000 in one of these incubators. I guarantee you it will fail, because they're two men who understand technology, they have college degrees, but they do not understand why people buy their product. I guarantee you it will fail. Large capital investments usually cause failures. Don't misunderstand, they're important to grow a business, but not till after it gets going. Three things, knowledge, capital, and discipline. And the knowledge is where we're lacking. But you will not create jobs without knowledge. We can talk maybe later about what that means. The capital, don't worry about that. Most businesses are started with none or very little. And the discipline, of course, is the difference. And I've had many people come up to me and say, hey, Blackwell, tell me, man, uh, how can I start a business? Or what they often ask is, where can I can get capital to start a business? And I'll say, well, what kind of business are you interested in? He said, I don't know. I just thought I'd get the capital. I'd raise the money first and then start a business. <laughs> no, it does not work that way. But the discipline is the difference. I'm betting on Oscar, because he hasn't missed a day getting up at 5 which is about when he used to go to bed, usually. But the difference was, in this case, a group called Kairos, who goes into prisons. And you just don't see people changing without changes in their faith, usually. Well, Bo, that's something that you dealt with. You've dealt with this population of, of people who oftentimes feel homeless, or ho homeless in the sense that they don't have a place in the, in the society. They feel very left out. Uh, they don't have what they need as far as job skills many times. And, and maybe they have never been taught how to go out and do things for themselves. And um, so tell us, with dealing with that population, how do you get them through to the next, next step of their life where they can uh, be self-sufficient and be successful? Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and, and a couple of points that I want to pick up on that were uh, mentioned here, one, 70% of most billionaires um, started out with nothing. I think that's an important point to show because um, I like my chances now of becoming a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> so. and, and Sam Walton didn't start till he was 45 years old, so if you're under 45, hey, you still got a chance to be the richest family in the world. I got four more years to get started, <laughs> let's go. Um, another key point though, the issue of transportation. That is a major issue. You gave the example of Oscar, and I'd love to talk to Oscar because we have a program to meet his specific need, but we know, and we've said it time and time again, that transportation is a major issue um, in terms of access to opportunities so that one can become self-sufficient. I met with uh, representatives from Discover. They're out in New Albany, uh, have over 1,800 employees, a great opportunity, but one of the gateways for anyone who wants to work with them is they, they must start off as a part-time employee uh, making about nine fifty an hour so they start off on the phones but then they hire seventy percent of their people internally so they wanted to connect with us to see if they, we could put people from our workforce development program into uh, some of their part-time positions with the opportunity to, to thrive in that environment we've actually had a couple who have done that and been promoted several times and are doing very well the issue became how will people get to their facility out in New Albany. Uh, their part-time position runs from 9 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, the bus, in order for them to catch the bus to get there, someone would have to leave 
at six o'clock in the morning, take the transfers, be dropped off there an hour before work. They're sitting around waiting until they can start at nine o'clock. They get off at two o'clock, but the bus does not come until five. So then they have to sit around for another three hours. Now, if you're a person who has children and childcare and all of those things, it's just not even possible. And so one of the programs that we created uh, was an IDA program, Individual Development Account. Um, and we typically will have those for people who are interested in micro enterprise, starting their own business, for education and for home ownership. But we created one for transportation. So now an individual can save up to $1,333. They can leverage that with a two to one match so that they can then purchase a vehicle for up to $4,000. And we've done that in partnership with the finance fund. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we want to address. And, and it seems to kind of stand to reason that people who have more money obviously will have uh, greater access to cars. But what we also found is people who have access to cars have greater access to um, higher incomes because of the opportunities and the transportation gap. And, you know, that's something you really don't think about. Um, but, you know, people in that situation, they do have barriers there. Steve, you've, you've grown your own business basically from the ground up, but you also took over a business that had some substantial problems when you took over and you, you brought that to the level of being very successful. And now you're advising people who are going out and starting businesses and working for themselves how to do that. So what advice would you give uh, people who are in programs uh, like we've heard about here when they go to start their own business? Well, thank you, and thanks uh, for having ECDI here. Um, first of all, business is just another word for problems and challenges. <laughs> so that's, that's, that should be made clear right off the bat. So I don't want to take too much credit for, for doing uh, what you said I did, because I find that every, every business, every problem is a challenge. And what we try to do at ECDI is we recognize the people that want to start businesses all have challenges. Um, Mr. Blackwell kind of stole my thunder. I could actually just get off the podium now because I could not agree with more with him about the knowledge, capital, and discipline triumvirate. And one of the big problems that people have, whether it's beginning a business or in its existing business, is lack of knowledge, lack of training, be it industry specific, or be it how to re read a financial statement, or just the fundamentals of writing a business plan and, and working on a cash flow. And at ECDI, we understand that training is critical to every would-be entrepreneur, and we understand that assessment of where they are on the continuum of their entrepreneur journey is critical. So we provide those tools. We have pre-loan training that is required of almost everybody that goes through any of our programs, be they an IDA program, similar to the programs that Bo spoke about, or be they expansion of a business, somebody that's already successful, or if it's a startup, especially if it's a startup. But we assess people early on to determine you know, what level of training and technical assistance they need. So we tried to knock down that problem or barrier right, right out of the gate before someone's even in our loan pipeline. Um, additionally, I agree with you immensely that the businesses that have too much capital at the beginning that come to us with people that have lent them money it's kind of a red flag for us sometimes. We want people to have their own skin in the game. So I agree with you wholeheartedly that we find, you know, if we look back at our portfolio, which now consists of 400 small business loans, $500 to $100,000, but um, there's like $12 million on the street. But the most successful ones, the ones that we have the least amount of problem with, are certainly people that have 5 or 10% of their own money in the game. And then, the, and then borrow some money from us and bootstrap and start to build their business that way. Um, I wanted to comment also, uh, a little off topic, but about what Bo said regarding transportation. It's a huge barrier to employment, and uh, the IDA, transportation IDA is so, so critical, and it's a critical tool in our toolkit because we don't just lend to small people aspiring to be entrepreneurs, but we, we help people kind of along that journey before they're loan ready, we have IDA programs similar to, to Bo's programs, both for down payment assistance, but most importantly for us is our micro enterprise IDA, which is a match savings program where somebody is employed, they seek to lift themselves out of working poverty and start their own business, 
and we too, they, they go through our classes, we save for six months, sometimes more, we can match them sometimes two to one, three to one, depending on the particular situation. So the IDA is a critical, critical uh, component of, of what we do. Marjorie, you know, we've had this awful, I, I think we can pretty much say it's an awful economy. Things have not been going well for people uh, in the past few years. And, um, you know, there are fewer dollars for organizations like yours um, as far as donations, and there's fewer government, there are fewer government dollars. Um, what, what kind of challenge does that pose for you, first of all, and um, what are you doing to try to help bridge people so that they can get into the jobs they need with maybe having fewer resources to do that? Well, first, let me give some context to the point you're making about uh, this great recession that we've got. Uh, people know that the unemployment rate for, for the general population is about 8.2 percent. 7.2 in Ohio, 8.2 nationally. nationally. Yes. Okay, nationally, the rate of unemployment for people with disabilities is closer to 13.5 percent mm -hmm. nationally. That doesn't really tell the story. It is probably three or four times higher than that. It's probably closer to 45 or 50 percent because many of those individuals, as you know, the unemployment rate only counts people that are employed full-time or part-time or on unemployment. It doesn't count individuals that ha are off of unemployment, been looking and seeking employment, and many of those folks are people with disabilities and other barriers. So uh, it is really a challenge. 60% of individuals that are ex-offenders are unemployed in this country. So to Roger's point, it is a, an epidemic actually, and something that we need to address. So uh, part of it is about partnerships and collaborations. Uh, I know that's sometimes an overused word, but with limited resources. Uh, we work with the Human Services Chamber. We work with organizations like Alvis House, with uh, Impact Community Action. We work with the YWCA and the YMCA. Several of those folks are here. We have a partnership between the Columbus Foundation Community Shelter Board Rebuilding Lives and Goodwill and Donato's because the corporate community is really an important part of this where we are identifying uh, formerly homeless individuals that are part of Rebuilding Lives and taking them through a management training program at Donato's. This isn't an entry level job. This is a management training program for formerly individu homeless individuals that will get them into a management position. You will never break the chronic cycle of homelessness unless somebody is employed and has a living wage and is economically self-sufficient. So all I could talk to you about partnerships with every one of those, uh, with every one of those organizations in the community. And then because Goodwill is a large agency, as I said, and we have resources through earned income, through our social enterprise model of operating businesses, those businesses, like our retail, janitorial, security businesses, they all are transitional employment for individuals to get that resume, um, to get something on their resume. It is a training ground for them, uh, and it also, in, in many cases, is, is about permanent employment. So, and as I said, COIC, I don't know if anybody's here from COIC, uh, great partner as, uh, as a, we're one of the other front doors, us and Jewish Family Services, another organization in the community that uh, provides that kind of connection and those various opportunities. Wow. Roger, if, if someone is trying to start their business, is trying to uh, do something and branch out on their own because they can't find a job out there, basically, um, it, what are what are they provided as far as skills? Do we have the kind of system educationally uh, that allows people to go out and have the skills to do that, or, or is that realistic? I can answer that question real quickly. No. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, my daughter went to Wellington, and I see a lot of friends with academy students, and it's always impressive at how many colleges they're going to go to when they list their graduates. Well, who cares? It, I really care about if they start another uh, Limited or another Worthington Industries and college is useful for that But the fact is we don't really give people the knowledge nor the cultural values about starting businesses and it, Who would be employed in Columbus today if it weren't for? Uh, <clears throat> people like Les Wexner and Jerome Schottenstein and uh, uh, Cheryl Kruger and uh, You could go on and on with that list 
Tens of thousands of jobs, where do they come from? People who start with one store, or that sort of thing. Uh, the Swedish experiment is interesting. You probably read about it in the last couple of weeks, it was just announced. Uh, over 10 years ago, in the Swedish schools, becoming a bastion of capitalism in con a contrarian view from what their image used to be, they started teaching entrepreneurship in high school. 10 years later, just study just came out, 24% of all those high school studies, students who studied entrepreneurship have started their own business with an average of five employees. Now, if we had a million high school students in America 10 years ago in these programs, and they had five employees today, on average, some of them have many more, some have only one, that would be an extra five million jobs. Anyone who believes we're going to stimulate the economy and create more jobs just doesn't understand economics. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the current economic policy is to get interest rates down. Who does that help? Big corporations, not little ones, not the micro interest. And when interest rates come down, who qualifies for those loans? Big corporations with a lot of equity and uh, good credit ratings. And what do they do with those loans? They get robotics and automation. And we have tax policies in this country that encourage rapid depreciation. They say, well, that's to go out and stimulate the economy and get more computers. To do what purpose? To reduce employment. I know CEOs very well. And you're measured, if you're an executive, by increase in annual EPS. Okay, Cisco just announced last week their profits were up 10%. Now, their sales were only up 5%. And anybody who thinks you're going to have 5% growth in GDP is smoking something that'll get you where you don't want to go. It just doesn't work that way. Here's what will happen, however. If you're a CEO of an executive and you've got to grow your profits, let's just say 10%, that's pretty respectable, and you get a big loan because the government tax policies encourage that, when's the last time you saw a bank say, we're going to make a loan for a company whose profits are down, but they've just said they're going to hire a thousand people. No. Cisco, profits up 10%, sales up 5%, just laid off 1,700 people. Big corporations, I started to say exist, that's not the right word, have the effect of destroying employment. The only net new jobs that are coming and will come in the future will be from small businesses. And we've got to start teaching them. We're doing a little bit, and there are, Junior Achievement does some great things, and there are pl some programs. But until we change the culture of this country to say, hey, small business creates jobs, we've got to teach people how to have the knowledge. And you know what? We've got to get some legislators and people who understand that the economy is not the reason we don't have jobs. That's not the reason. It's because of the lack of knowledge of developing entrepreneurs. And if you don't know the cause of the problem, you won't know the cure. Steve, let's follow up on that a little bit. Is it hard for these small businesses to get loans in this economic climate? Are you finding that? Yeah, un unfortunately, this is the best of times for the ECDIs of the world. You know, we're CDFI, and there's several of us like us around the country a few in the state of Ohio, but we're the only one of scale that concentrates in the state of Ohio. And we hear every story you can imagine. I mean, obviously, our core mission is to serve the under and unbanked. And historically, before the recession, we served mostly, historically, never been banked folks. But since the Great Recession, as they call it, which I agree with Mr. Blackwell is not going away too quickly as far as for small business, um, we see a lot of people that used to have, you know, with small businesses that used to have loans with banks that no longer can get loans from their banks, even with all the, you know, the bailout money, the TARP money, et cetera, that has nothing to do with it. The banks are trying to return an investment or return for their, their investors, and the banks are a lot of times focused on concentrations in their portfolio. And for various reasons, they are um, not lending small, you know, small commercial loans. And a lot of times they never really did. People were accessing credit in different ways, friends, family, equity in their home. And we understand that because the banks are some of our biggest supporters, so I'm not up here to bash the banks. 
although I am here to tell you that we've never had more people walking through our doors seeking funding and uh, no slowdown is, is, is in sight. As a matter of fact, we just opened up in Cleveland and um, we had a grand opening and the mayor was there and the county administrator and the president of Huntington Bank, the region. And within three days, we had 500 calls or emails from people with or wanting to start small businesses. I mean, unprecedented demand because Cleveland's never had anything like us up there. So um, the reality of it is people are, and this doesn't mean everybody's loan worthy and they need our services and they need the education up front. And also part of what we do, if I can say, is we also provide ongoing technical assistance, unlike a bank, we're an incubator and we continue, and that's where the discipline comes in that Roger was talking about. We continue to check in with our clients, see what resources they need, be it management, consulting, marketing. Um, we also have our own food incubator for our, because a large part of our portfolio are food clients. So we have something that's a social enterprise, as you were discussing, called the Food Fort, which enables people to use our commercial kitchen we have food trucks and food carts that we help incubate small businesses with. But unfortunately, this problem isn't going away. You're preaching to the choir. You can come work for us anytime you want, hopefully starting later on today. And uh, <laughs> the reality of it is, you know, we create job, we create businesses, you know, with people, two to five people every single day. We've created a job a day and a business a week since 2004. That's what we've done. <laughs> Bo, just real quickly, I know you've got a background working with big brothers, big sisters. You've worked in a lot of groups uh, like that where you help empower people. Uh, do you find that people that you work with have even the dream or the knowledge that they, they are willing to jump out on their own? That's a great question. That's actually where I wanted to go. Um, <laughs> because th there's a couple things that we need to understand when we talk about poverty. We look at it in terms of um, kind of two different large populations that we're working with. You have those who are part of generational poverty, um, who after generation after generation have grown up in poverty, and there's a set of barriers that we need to address with them. Uh, and then you have folks who are in situational poverty because they have lost a job or had a health ailment, and they actually have the skills and the support system to get back on their feet quicker. Um, they just need a little support getting there. And so um, we deal with a lot of people who, for the very first time, have had to walk through our door seeking our services. And we find that it's very easy to work with them. Um, we identify what they need in, in order to um, become work ready and to take advantage of new opportunities. But for generational poverty, um, there's significant more work that needs to be done. And that's why case management um, is, is very important so that we're really working with them uh, in terms of developing a plan. So even with the people that we're helping through our micro enterprise to develop a business, we want to make sure that they're going to be successful in that business. And sometimes they need the, the employment readiness training that we provide. So our workforce development program is an eight week program where we're working with them Monday through Friday, nine to four, trying to help them um, understand all of the things that they need to, to understand in terms of work etiquette, and um, employment readiness, and we're able to observe them over the course of two months. I've, I've had a lot of people have said to me, look, I don't need another program, I need a job. Uh, but unfortunately, in order to get that job and keep that job, there's some work that needs to be done, and so we're able to work with them over that period of time. And so when you talk about pursuing your dream, um, I have some packets out there on the, um, on the bench, and there's, there's one lady that I'd love to just highlight. It's anecdotal, but it, it really tells the story of what I think we need to be looking at in terms of all of the barriers. Her name is Sandra Hogan. Uh, she's in that packet. She came to us, um, someone who was incarcerated, who was drug addicted, who was homeless, who was living in the streets and doing whatever she needed to do to survive. Uh, and she heard about our program and she came through our reentry program. Um, she tells her story in there, and I, I want you to see it because she came with the dream of wanting to be a heavy machine operator. Uh, not a typical field for most women, and so we said, okay, well, we're going to help you achieve that dream. She went through our program, and one of the things that um, we understand with, with the people who said, I don't need another program, I need a job, is because they still have resources um, that they need in order to survive. And so part of our workforce development program is we provide a stipend so that they could at least take care of their basic needs while they're getting the training that they need. 
she eventually went on and this is where when people talk about it's important to build your network to build relationships more important than that is how do you leverage those relationships um, to some end or some benefit we worked directly with Cowick, uh, who had a program where they would pay for the training um, and so she was able to go to uh, a school that basically taught her how to operate heavy machinery um, it cost four thousand dollars to enroll in that school Cowick paid for that she needed certain equipment and tools we used our resources to pay for that then she once she graduated in order to really get a successful job she needed to be part of the union we helped her pay her union due so that she could join the union she eventually got a job working in a warehouse making nineteen dollars an hour driving a forklift but it didn't stop there because her real dream was to be heavy machinery she said I want to be outside in the big bulldozers you know <laughs> bringing up the dirt and so she had the opportunity to go for a temporary job uh, making $35 an hour and she was struggling with do I leave this $19 an hour job that's sustainable and um, take the uh, the chance on this temporary job but it's what I want to do and we worked with her we encouraged her to pursue her dream uh, she now works for Wright Patterson Air Force Base building roadways for uh, airplanes making $35 an hour uh, you'll see pictures of her with her pink hard hat she's very proud of that and she said what's next for her is she wants to build a business that will hire women and ex-offenders to go into that line of business and so she's developed the skills and understands it so now we need to help her find the capital because she has the knowledge the desire and the discipline uh, to become a successful entrepreneur. Well, this sure has given us some ideas here, and I, I'm sure some of you might have some questions, so it's your turn. Uh, there's a microphone over here. The Columbus uh, Metropolitan Club always takes time to let you ask some questions. I see some of you lining up. Uh, the CMC records all of its forums for televised broadcasts on ONN, streaming on CMC's website, and the Columbus Metropolitan Library's website. So if you have a question, please go to the microphone, and I'll ask you please to uh, not make long editorial comments when you, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, <laughs> when you ask your questions. <laughs> and, uh, and just state your name and uh, ask your question of our guests, please. Cool. Uh, Phil Sorrentino. Uh, I believe that first-rate people like to be around all kind of people, because I believe the same spirit that's in you is the same spirit that's in me. Second-rate people like to be around third-rate people because they go, I'm not as bad as them. <laughs> and they feel real uncomfortable being around first-rate people. What kind of assessments do you use to determine if somebody's first-rate, second-rate, or third-rate? And then what do you do to move them up the scale? Um, I can begin with that. I, I don't, we don't assess people, you know, to be first-rate, second-rate, third-rate, because what we're interested in if somebody comes in for a business loan is the likelihood that they're going to be successful and we look at their business plan and we look at the some of the things we've been talking about today in terms of their makeup and are they disciplined are they going to work hard um, and do they have an expertise in the field they want to go into I really believe and we believe that you know a lot of us are entrepreneurial but certainly not all of us are entrepreneurs and our job is to make sure that we don't lend money and put somebody in a worse situation than they were when they came to see us we're here to start businesses and grow jobs not put people into bankruptcy and excessive debt. So our assessment tools are such that they allow us to determine you know, what people know about running a business, what they know about business, what they know about cash flow, what they know about the three pillars of running a business. And then when they're in our pipeline and they're in our training pipeline, you know, they're, put, they're put through the test. They meet with people individually, they work on their business plan, they get assignments. It's not just throw them into the pipeline and if they have a 750 credit score, we're gonna give them a loan. That's not it at all, because those are the businesses that fail. So part of the training pipeline is really part of the character pipeline. So we really get to understand who they are, what they are, what their goals are, and what their chances of success are. Because everybody that comes to us, there's gonna be something wrong with one of their four C's in their credit profile probably, even if they were formerly, formerly banked. But the reality of it is we're looking for a reason to make a loan, but we don't wanna go overboard. So we have to find the mitigating factor it allows us to do so, um, but so that, that's kind of how we assess. Our assessment isn't just like a, a test, although there, we do use tools, but it's, it's a process and it takes time and, and working with individuals before we give them a loan. And, and uh, in our case, one of the 
Uh, one of the tools that we offer is our detailed assessments. Oftentimes somebody comes to us and they really don't know what they want. They don't really understand what their skills and their strengths are. So we use a number of different tests. We, we test some of our clients over a two week period. And again, it's not a pop quiz kind of test. It's, it's an assessment that really gets people to focus in on what their skills are, what their interests are. Uh, and then we can guide and direct those individuals either to programs we have. We have seven different computer module training programs, core office, medical billing, customer service, customer call center, or we have an STNA program, State Tested Nursing Assistant Program. That is the entry point, as you know, into the healthcare profession, which is a really um, good and growing profession. And so, or we can guide them to other organizations and other programs to get those individuals trained because they are gonna need some training and some skill in order to get employed. Okay, well, um, you're next. You get to ask your question here of our panelists. Bill Wagner of the uh, Wagner Machine Works, a figment of my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Professor Blackwell. Um, as stars are awarded to generals, one might assign garages to unto entrepreneurs. Now, my question, uh, in, in, in that rating, certainly Steve Jobs and Bill Gates would be awarded three car garages. <laughs> Now, my question is, how do you rate the late Vice Admiral Grace Opper? <laughs> Grandmother of Cobalt? Uh, I'd rate her as, I'd rate somebody I need to know more about. <laughs> <laughs> Grace Hopper, Grandmother of Cobalt. Ed, uh, Vice Admiral Grace Hopper. Yeah. Well, the lady who uh, actually did uh, the programming on the original Manhattan Project was a math major from Northwest Missouri State University. Happen to know that one, but uh, <laughs> and they had to, they didn't have any software back then. This is pre COBOL, and uh, so they had math majors. They could build the computers, but they didn't know how to program or run them, and so. They brought in people who had never done it, and I would call them entrepreneurs. They didn't make millions, but they were entrepreneurial. Okay. Thank okay. You. Our next question, please. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about. I'm Jane Scott. I'm curious, and this has been a fabulous panel. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I frequently say CMC points the spotlight at the people who are changing the world, and I think today's a really good example of that. Thank you. Um, changing the culture. You talked about changing the culture to have um, um, a greater emphasis and a greater appreciation for small business. If you were king of the world, what should we do to change that culture? Well. This is going to sound a little self-serving, but I'm up here and you're down there, so that's okay, right? <laughs> the right of the mic. <laughs> what I would do is, from my perspective, I would encourage everyone in this room and everyone in this room to tell 10 people that there are means available for all of you and for all of us to invest local, to make more capital available that, that an organization like ECDI and others around the country, depending where you live, will promise you that every dollar will be invested in a local small business and every dollar will be leveraged with two other dollars. As we happen to do at ECDI, it's called Invest Local Ohio. And it's an investment, not a donation. It gives you the opportunity to invest and get a small return over a three to five year period. So I would start there. I would also start with telling people to be very, very aware of where you buy everything. Become a logo, local for buy everything and everything you can from small and local businesses. Support small and, lo small and local businesses. Join SOUL, which I can't think what that acronym stands for right now, but I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> it's a local organization that supports all things local and buying local. And above and, and above and beyond all that, volunteer for organizations like mine and the other panelists up here with me today. So that's what I would advise you. I'd add one thing to that. I'm wearing my Upper Arlington School Board hat on now. Uh, if we want to change a culture, 
uh, it starts, and we were talking about high schoolers, it starts within schools and creating an entrepreneurial, uh, innovative culture with our students. Get them to start their own small businesses uh, in, in, in elementary and middle school and teach those, uh, those actual uh, kind of the framework for what it's like and embrace people that think out of the box and are entrepreneurial. I think it starts in our school system, quite frankly, if we're gonna change culture around, uh, around uh, small business. Good afternoon, I'm Yvonne Honeycutt, the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County. And actually, Margie just stole my question. Um, I, was, I was wanting to know what are some of your organizations doing around addressing another underserved population or harder to employ population of young people, particularly you know, the transitional age youth, 16 to 24, where college is not necessarily an option. Uh, vocational programs are not necessarily growing in an abundance and addressing some of the um, unmet workforce needs. Um, are any of your organizations doing anything specifically to address those young people? We're, uh, thanks for that question, we're very involved at Goodwill in a number of different partnerships. That whole issue of transitional youth uh, is one that is a growing challenge as well. Uh, we have, again, it comes, it, it's about partnerships. We have a tremendous partnership with Giant Eagle. Uh, they, uh, particularly individuals with developmental disabilities that are being transitioned, but others with behavioral issues and other issues. Uh, we have a, a, a six-week training program. We train them on the soft skills, and then they do training at Giant Eagle, and there is always a job. In 98% of those cases, there is a job at the end of that training program. We have a lot of other training programs. We get money from COIP for summer youth training. We have trained a lot of youth uh, in our uh, retail stores. Uh, summer employment, many of those individuals, we encourage them and they actually, because of their experience in a retail store, went on to Columbus State to get uh, two-year degrees. Uh, we started a chef apprentice program with the, the once Buckeye Hall of Fame Cafe for at-risk youth transitioning out of high school, um, training them to be chef apprentices. That's a living wage job. And then they worked at Buckeye Hall of Fame Cafe and were working with another restaurant and catering company to develop that. So lots of opportunities. Uh, you gotta find the, the, you got to find the connections, and corporate partners are really important with that. And I would just add that changing the culture or maybe reinforcing it. We do have some good organizations, mainly at the college level. SIF, Students Inter Interested in Free Enterprise. We have some very good entrepreneurial programs, but we need to move that on down. But we also need to move to other schools, but we also need to move it up. Who do we respect in this world that we live in? Is it the person because they're wealthy or because they created a lot of jobs? And you know, if you look at where would Columbus be without Wendy's? And Dave Thomas, I don't know which college did he graduate from? <laughs> uh, and <laughs> yeah, and, and and the people, the only it's not the Federal Reserve that will determine the future of this economy. It is not President Romney nor President Obama. They will both fail absolutely. And anybody who believes the president's going to have much effect on jobs is naive. I could use other words, but. Uh, <laughs> But the people who are going to create the, all the net new jobs in the future are small business people. And if we don't respect those people and encourage them, don't ever expect this economy to be a fixed. Well, thank you all. Um, it's encouraging. <laughs> it's, a, it's encouraging to be encouraging to be reminded of the resources uh, and the advice that's available um, and we should all spread the word um, and get some people to Steve and Margie and others to uh, to get started and be entrepreneurial and create jobs um, next week sign up uh, IDS uh, August 8th and this and remember our summer celebration on the 29th uh, you can have coffee and cookies and speak with these folks some more. But before you do, let's thank Steve, Margie, Roger, Bo, and Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Come back soon. <laughs>